good afternoon to all. Uh, my name is Yekaterina Lagvinovich, and I am uh, an associate in SBH law offices. And I specialize primarily in uh, corporate law and investment support from uh, business angels and venture capital investments to transnational M&A transactions. Uh, also, I consult IT companies uh, on various issues and specialize in taxes. Uh, my law firm, SBH Law Offices, is a regional firm with uh, offices in Ukraine and Belarus, and we provide the full scope of legal services for business, including business registration, registration in high technology spark, uh, intellectual property protection, representation of the interest in the court, uh, and so on. And uh, we have the honor to have uh, the global IT companies among our clients, as well as uh, we are proud to support local startup communities in our activities. For example, we cooperate with the Imaguru and uh, Minsk, uh, Tech Minsk Venture Fund in its uh, funding activities. And the topic of my speech is uh, registration of business. Why the registration is necessary? Uh, what's the stages? You should, you should take into account and what are the primary issues uh, the founders shall be focused on. And turn into the first issue, uh, which is the reasons why uh, the registration is necessary. Uh, the first uh, moment is that uh, registration is about your legal safety. So what, mean, what we mean under registration of business is to register a company, to maintain your business, to sell your products, to employ your employees, and to pay taxes. So under legislation of any country, if you gain money from your activity, this is business, and thus it needs to be registered and comply with the legal regulations. Uh, certainly, if you have an, an idea which you develop and a team for, uh, which consists of a few persons which are inspired to develop your product, there is no need to register a company at the moment, but the company shall be registered by the moment when you receive your first money. Uh, and because you receive money, it's business, and since it's business, it shall be registered. So primarily the registration is about safety and safety of all the persons which are involved in the activities of your company. So these are firstly founders, secondly, your team, including developers, maybe market analysts and so on, your future investors and business in general. Uh, as concerning the founders, uh, there are three core interests which are protected by the business registration. And the first is compliance with law. Uh, if you receive some income without any official source, uh, the tax authorities usually have the questions, what is, what is this income and what is the source of your money? And if you will not have any lawful basis to receive this money, uh, you can be found in violation of the laws. You can be imposed with some fines from tax authorities. So this is the question of your personal financial safety, as well as your clear history without any economic crimes and violations. Uh, second, registration of business is the way to formalize and to fix your contribution to business. Uh, for example, if there are three founders, you go to the registration authority and you register a company in which each of the founders have uh, the share, for example, 33%, or you can determine the share as you would like. Um, and uh, this share in business is uh, like uh, your official contribution to business, which grants you the right to management, right portion of profits. You can share, uh, you can uh, sell your share to the investor and so on when you would like to exit from the company. So it's something that you formalized. And um, if you do not have a company, your contribution is, uh, it is not fixed anywhere. Mm -hmm. So the company will help you to stay in the management and to be involved in the business and the decision-making process. And third, it's the limitation of your personal liability for the debts of your business. When you register a company, 
it uh, has its own responsibility under national laws. It's ha it has its own bank accounts, its own obligations and rights. And so even if the startup will finish its activities, debts will be paid by the company itself, not from your personal income. And uh, it's important and that your losses, possible losses and losses of the investors will be limited only by their contribution, but not any money that you have. Uh, as concerning the developers and team members, they are also obliged to pay taxes from the income that they receive. So you could not simply pay them money for development of the project, but they should file some uh, tax returns and uh, explain to tax authorities where this source come from, comes from. And if you hire officially your team to the company, you protect them from, from the legal perspective uh, and safe from any questions from the state authorities. So I think it's a, a great motivation for your team to be officially hired. Uh, as concerning the investors, the interests are quite similar to those of the founders. So firstly, invest investors want to ensure that business will be stable and transparent with the law. Um, and for investors, registration proves also the seriousness of founders, their readiness to comply with the formalities. Uh, it's uh, a great possibility to formalize the investment. So if the investor gives you money, he usually would like to receive a share. If we will look on all the investments instruments that are usually used, loans, convertible loans, uh, safes, and so on, they all are concluded with the companies, not with personal uh, founders. Uh, that's why if you start to raise your round, if you would like to participate in any accelerator venture capital fund activities, it's usually one of the first things that you will be asked before your idea will be discussed. This is to register the company and to transfer intellectual property rights from persons to, to it. This is not simply the desire of the investor, but uh, this is like a quite objective requirement for stability of the business because if there will be some problems in personal relations between the founders, the company which uh, possesses all the assets and all the rights will continue to exist and uh, the business will work uh, despite any possible problems, personal problems. Uh, and apart from the legal safety, business registration, it's about uh, mitigation of risks and compliance with laws. So uh, if you act transparently, the risk to lose money is lower and about your business reputation, because the presence of registration will show to your partners, investors, clients, that you create a real existing business that is regulated under the laws that they can rely on you. Uh, and um, simply that you're a transparent, uh, good counter agent to enter into relations with. Um, uh, what concerns the forms of entities and jurisdictions? There are various forms of such entities, uh, such as uh, limited liability companies uh, in Russian, stock companies, partnerships, uh, but only a few of them are appropriate for startups. Uh, firstly, in the view of uh, restricting liability, as I, told, uh, as I have told uh, earlier, um, investors and founders need to restrict their liability by their contribution uh, and not all the entities provide such possibility in Belarus. It's uh, uh, stock companies and limited liability companies, but the appropriate form is limited liability company, uh, firstly, because it's protect uh, owners from the debts of the company. And secondly, because it's the most uh, comfortable for the investors uh, to give money. Uh, in specific cases, when you will need company in the USA or the United Kingdom, the appropriate form will be a stock company. And this is Akcenyerne Obshistva in Russian. Um, it also limits the liability and uh, it's more 
also more comfortable for the investors in this jurisdiction to give money. So in Belarus, it's limited liability company and in the USA and UK, it's usually a stock company or stock corporation. Um, as concerning the jurisdictions, there are in general three options. And the first option is the country where the founders are physically located. So if your founders are all in Belarus, your team is in Belarus, your clients are also here, it's, um, I think the, the best option is to start from business here and to register a company in Minsk. Uh, sometimes startups also incorporate in other jurisdictions, for example, so-called offshore jurisdictions like Cyprus, Delaware, or jurisdictions which provide some specific preferences for IT companies. Um, in Belarus, the example is the High Technologies Park, which provides uh, very sufficient tax preferences. That's why in Belarus, uh, more, many foreign countries are also incorporated, not only Belarusian startups. But this is the important uh, issue when the business is growing and you see the necessity to lower the cost for the taxes. And the third option is the jurisdictions with developed ecosystems. They are firstly USA, Silicon Valley, uh, sometimes UK, Israel. Um, I know the examples when startups uh, uh, go there uh, because it's easier to find money uh, because there are more startups, more investors, more venture funds. Um, maybe sometimes uh, the startups also participate in some local accelerators and so on, and that's why they need to incorporate here. But in general, on all the stages, I recommend to start from your own country because it's easier to manage the company like in place when, if, when you're physically present. Uh, but with growth of business and with raising funds, you shall be ready um, to the possible uh, development of the structure of your company. Sometimes you will need like holding company in Delaware to hold all the assets and for your investments and, for example, the company in Belarus in place. Uh, the procedure of registration of the company is not very complicated in any jurisdiction, but the terms could differ. Um, on the slide, you can see the example of Belarus, what you shall do to register a company. So the first stage is to find a legal address. Um, you may have the real office for your employees, but if you do not need it, you could simply rent an address and to insert it to your registration documents. Then you shall visit the registration authority and agree the name of the company. This is needed to, um, to confirm that there are no companies with the same name. So this is a usually quite a quick procedure, but you shall check all the requirements uh, about like there are some prohibited words which you could not use and so on. Uh, certainly you shall decide who will be the director of your company. So it shall be the member of your team who will be responsible for the current activities. Um, so it's CEO. Maybe you have uh, one or you will need to decide who will be like the, the most responsible person for all the organization issues. So you shall design the decision on creation of the company, pay the state fee. This is not a big amount and go to the authorities and submit these documents. They include the application, which is uh, about the details of the founders which are granted with the share and the charter. The charter is usually a standard corporate document which uh, regulates the management within the company and some basic, uh, basic provisions of uh, its activities. And a few days later, you will receive automatically issued certificates of uh, registration in other authorities such as tax authorities, statistics authorities, and then you can register your bank account. So um, the procedure is quite uh, simple. It um, is similar in other jurisdictions, but there can be differences. For example, uh, we know the ways when the company in Delaware could be registered even more quickly than in Belarus because it could be registered remotely by simply 
uh, fill in the questionnaire and that's all. So this is what shall be checked with uh, each the jurisdiction. But in Belarus, it will take for about one or two weeks to start your activities at the, as the company. Uh, about the corporate management, there are uh, three obligatory management bodies that shall be in any event in your company. So firstly, is general meeting of the shareholders. These are all the persons which are granted the share in the statutory fund. Uh, at the first stage, uh, these persons are simply the founders, but with the development of business, the shareholders could be investors, advisors, employees, which are granted the share, and that's all. Um, the general meeting decide the most fundamental issues. Uh, for example, it holds the annual meeting, approves accounting statement, distributes profits of the company to the shareholder, and uh, usually elects other corporate bodies. The director or CEO, as I have mentioned, performs all current activities. So it signs the contract, it manages money, it represents all your interest without any power of attorney. So it should be a person whom you really rely because uh, his powers under our legislation are quite wide. And in many relations, they could not be limited. So he has absolute power to represent your company anywhere. Uh, and this is uh, what shall be taken into account. The third official is the auditor or revisor in Russian. This is a person who checks the financial activities and documents. This is quite a formal figure. So usually he looks through the documents before the annual meeting and drafts a short um, report that the activities are okay with the law. But this is a person who shall be appointed like a formal requirement under the legislation. Um, Another um, management body is board of directors. I have written that this is optional. On the first stages, you will not need this organ, but with the investment to the company, uh, some investors which provide uh, sufficient sums could um, ask you to form this organ and uh, where the investors will be also represented. And this organ will um, execute supervisory authority. So it determines the strategy of the company, maybe approves the largest transactions, but it, it, it is not involved in the current activities as a director. So only on the most, uh, on the most important issues. Uh, apart from the registration, what is very important from my point of view is also your further actions because um, it's not enough simply to register a company. The company shall be transparent and its corporate history shall be understandable for the investors because this is what they will check during all your rounds. They will look through the documents and ask you questions why this decision is made in such form. Uh, why the shares distribution is like that. Uh, so this is very important to, to avoid mistakes from the very beginning of the registration, to make your corporate structure reasonable, um, to lower cost, costs further and not to waste your time before the investment round. So. We know, for example, the practice when the startup create the company in, in proper form, for example, in the USA, in the form of limited liability company, which is very uncomfortable for investors. And they were simply to close this company and register another one. So if they had uh, a proper uh, form initially, they will not lose time before they will receive this money. Um, so after the registration, uh, you shall check the following important moments. First, it's proper making of corporate decision. So these rules are written in your charter and you shall comply with it. Uh, it concerns the quorum, the compliance with the rights of the shareholders, receiving approvals from um, the management bodies if they're necessary. Secondly, it's the conclusion of contract with the clients and all the cash flows under, uh, under them. Uh, 
So I think it's like the initial aim of registering the company. So you like make a uniform approach to all your cash flows. And your clients shall know that you have this one entity and all the transactions are made from them. So you will know you will not have some third sources of income. All the sources will be in one entity. Uh, thirdly, it's formalizing the relationship between the company and all its employees, uh, especially its key developers. Uh, my colleague Anna will um, tell you about this in detail, but this is not simply to hire a person, but to also include confidentiality clauses, transfer of intellectual property rights, and the regular payment of salaries, because all of these are um, possible risks for the investor of inconsistency with the laws. Uh, fourthly, it's transfer of intellectual property from the founders and developers to the company, because if the company doesn't have intellectual property in uh, its ownership, uh, there is a risk that you can uh, lose all your business because one of the developers simply registers it or uses for its own idea. So if we speak about IT startups, uh, it's the uh, core protection of business is to check your intellectual property and to transfer all from persons to the company. Um, the two issues which remain is the payment of taxes. Uh, they are paid a few times within a year, so you shall check the dates. Uh, it's better to have the accountant to avoid uh, fines to, and to avoid problems with the state organs. And for this purpose, you shall also reflect all your operations in your accounting statements. So to sum up, uh, the company shall be registered, but it could uh, be done, it shall not be done immediately. Uh, the company will be needed uh, when your first money uh, will be gained. The appropriate form for Belarus is limited liability company because it's limited the liability of the founders and it also uh, is comfortable for investors. Um, I recommend to start from the jurisdiction where the team is physically located, founders team and supposedly the clients, but you shall be ready that with the investments rounds and the growth of the business, your structure could become more complicated and involve other jurisdictions uh, uh, to save the investments and maybe to extend your business to other markets. Um, corporate structure shall be uh, made in details and considered in details on the first stages because any mistakes in the structure will be, um, will be difficult to change further and it could take more money uh, to mitigate these risks. And um, the last point is that registration is only the first stage. So your business shall be in general consistent with the laws so that it will be safe for the investors and um, transparent for the employees uh, and stable uh, in its commercial activities. So uh, as concerning my speech, that's all. Uh, on this slide, you can see the contact information. And certainly we have about five, seven minutes for the questions, if there are any. Uh, yes, thank you so much for this amazing speech, Ekaterina. And yes, we have some questions from our followers. Um, the first one would be, what is the most difficult in any company's registration, in your opinion? Mm, I think the most uh, difficult is to decide on the corporate structure and the relations between founders, because um, the contribution of different founders could be also different. So you can decide that uh, contribution of each of the founders is equal and you will divide the company by I don't know, three parts. But uh, somebody could say that, no, my contribution is bigger and your contribution is lower. So I think that the core uh, and the potential for problems is the ability of the founders to decide 
um, to decide what their relations shall be and uh, which share each of them shall possess. And uh, in other part, I do not see the problems in the registration procedure because this is quite a formal action. So the documents are usually standard, the procedure is not very difficult. So um, yes, I, I do not see any problems apart from this agreement between the founders. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the second question is, when isn't it worth registering a company? Um, could you please repeat because I did not hear. Yes, uh, when isn't it worth registering a company? So uh, as I understand, this means that whether there are situations when the company is not needed. Uh, I guess so, yes. Um, it's not needed when uh, you do not receive money. It could take quite a long time. So if you're developing your idea, if you're simply working, uh, trying to find clients, um, and there is no need for a company. Uh, but when uh, the issue of money arises, company will be needed. I do not know situations when startups could uh, uh, grow without a company. So it's very strange situation when the startup acts like individual entrepreneur or separate individuals. You will face the situation when for your further growth and for attracting investors, you will need to incorporate. So I think this is the obligatory stage for all the startups, but um, the um, certain moment depends on your on the speed of development of your business and on the moment of monetization of your product. Okay, thank you. And the next question is, how often do you need to confirm startup registration? Mm. Uh, we have regular um, moments with startup registration. So it's like a standard legal service of our company. Um, but um, it doesn't mean that you could not register it without a law firm. So you shall decide um, in your certain circumstances whether you need simply to form it uh, briefly on the basis of standard documents and uh, simply to continue uh, to exercise your activities. Or maybe you will be already within the investment round when you shall take into account the preferences of the investors and their interest. And maybe in such case, you will need a lawyer. But in general, this is uh, um, business registration is quite standard legal service and uh, almost all business consultants uh, provide such services. Everyone, um, I'm very pleased to be here today. Thank you for inviting me over to be a speaker. Um, I also prepared a presentation. So if you don't mind, I will share my screen with you. Um, so. I hope you can see it. Yes. Great. Okay, now, um, by way of introduction, um, my name is Anna Soltanovich. I'm an associate at SBH Law Offices in Minsk. Um, I specialize in foreign economic activity in labor law and in personal data mostly, and also in general contracting law. So my colleague, uh, Ekaterina Lagvinovich, already gave her presentation on certain corporate and regulatory aspects of starting a company. And um, I want to talk to you today about the basics of Belarusian employment law. And here I need to say that um, it is impossible to cover all aspects of employment law because it's a very complex and broad range of law. Um, however, I will try to give you a basic understanding of how employment law works in Belarus and to give you just a very, very general overview of some basic aspects. And I hope it will not be super boring for you. Um, maybe it doesn't sound as exciting as previous topics that were covered, but uh, please bear in mind that if you decide to start a company, uh, knowing and being aware of certain legal aspects beforehand will help you to avoid a lot of problems in future. I mean, legal problems. So I hope my presentation will help you to understand the, the most important things you need to know if you're deciding to start a company in Belarus. So today we will discuss several 
key topics about employment law. Firstly, I will talk about the basics of employment law, uh, the distinction between employees and, um, and independent contractors. Um, secondly, I will talk about the employment agreement, the main uh, document in employment relations between the company and the employees. Also, I will talk about the remuneration of the employees, meaning about the salary and how to pay it and how much to pay your employees. And uh, lastly, I will cover a very uh, popular topic nowadays, which is remote work and how it is different from uh, the normal office work that we are used to. So let's start first with some basics of employment law and um, the distinction between employees and independent contractors. Um, when starting a company, let's say as a founder, you need to find people who will actually do the work and make your company gain profit. And here you will eventually face the, uh, the need to make a choice between employees and independent contractors. And before going further into the employment law, um, I, um, I would like to draw the line between the employees and independent contractors because at some point your company will most likely need both of them. So firstly, employees are people who are hired by a company to provide labor for a long-term period and they work under employment agreements, they receive a specific type of remuneration that is called salary, and they enjoy special benefits and protections that are granted to them by the legislation. Um, and on a side note, I wanted to, to draw your attention to the fact that it is very important to understand that the labor law um, in most countries, I think in all countries, not only in Belarus, uh, is aimed main, mainly at protecting the employee's interest in the first place, um, because the employee is seen in this relationship as a weaker party. So this is particularly seen when dealing with employment disputes, for example, where the court in most cases rules um, any discrepancies or any inconsistencies in the favor of the employee. So this is one of the most important principles of employment law, of labor law. And uh, the reason why I'm telling you this now is because um, any decision made by the employer has to be very carefully evaluated prior um, from the perspective if it complies with the law and if it complies with the employer's interest, because it will help to avoid potential disputes in future. Um, so now <laughs> continuing with the distinction, relationship between the employer and the employee is categorized as employment relations, uh, relationship and it is governed mainly by the labor code. So this is the main legal act in the sphere of employment law. And if you need to check any, um, how, these or that issues regulated in law uh, when you are dealing with employment, you need to go check the labor code first. And on the contrary, an independent contractor is a person who performs works or renders services independently. And uh, this person is not engaging into any employment relations. And from the legal perspective, the independent contractor and the client, they are equal parties to a commercial relationship. So um, the work is provided by this person under a civil contract, and thus the, this relationship is governed by civil legislation, namely the civil code of the Republic of Belarus and other uh, related acts. Um, so if you need people who are working for you on daily basis, it's better to hire them as employees. And further, I will explain how to do this. Um, if your company needs certain services or works rendered um, on a one-off basis, uh, maybe once or twice. For example, let's say if you need to develop a logo for your company and um, it's only work that you need to, to get done. Um, and further, you don't need to, to keep um, a graphic designer as your employee. Then you can just um, hire an independent contractor. You can... Um, uh, you can offer this person to, to develop a logo for your company for a certain amount of remuneration. You can conclude a civil contract. When the work is done, you will terminate the contract. And this is how your relationship ends with this person. Um, and on the contrary, if you employ a person, if you hire a person, this is a long-term relationship normally. 
and uh, they are regulated by special labor legislation. Um, so I hope this is clear. And uh, now I also wanted to say that legally there are no requirements on how many people a company should employ, but um, well, there, there can be one or two person employed in a company. But in reality, you will most likely need more people. So first of all, you will need a director, uh, well, management, someone from the management, a person who will represent your company um, and who will act on behalf of your company. It can be a CEO or a managing director, whatever you like. Uh, secondly, you will most likely need a chief accountant. Uh, it is an obligation of every company to, um, to do the accounting. And usually most companies have a chief accountant as uh, their employee so that this work is done easily. But um, if you don't want to, to keep a, a chief accountant uh, in your company as an employee, you can also outsource this function. This is also an option. And thirdly, you of course need general employees who will perform the work um, and the, the number and the positions, uh, everything depends on the type of business that your company is performing. Now, um, let's move further to the employment agreement. This part will be even more legal, a little bit boring maybe, but it also should be known um, by anyone who wishes to start a company. First of all, employment agreement is the main and the most important document in employment relations. It must be signed with all employees. There are no exceptions. Um, and generally, there are two types of employment agreements uh, distinguished by the law. The, this distinction depends on the term of the agreement. So firstly, there is indefinite term agreement. You can see it on the slide. Um, the the uh, the name speaks for itself. It means that this agreement doesn't have any term, any fixed period of um, effectiveness. And secondly, there is a fixed term agreement, an agreement that has an end date. And one important, um, um, important type, let's say, of this fixed term agreement is a contract. Um, now, currently in Belarus, most employees are employed under contracts which are fixed term agreements and they are subject to a special regulation. Um, and also uh, contracts, uh, it, a contract is the most popular option. And the second popular option is an employment agreement, indefinite term agreement, the one that doesn't have a fixed uh, effective term. Here on this table, I um, put the main differences between indefinite term agreements and contracts. You can see here that firstly, it is of course the term. Uh, the indefinite term contract doesn't have an end date. Uh, and on the contrary, the contract in fact has an end date. It has an effective period and the contract can be concluded for minimum one year and maximum five years. So if um, when the five year term of the contract expires, the employer is obliged to conclude a new contract uh, or a new employment agreement because this one has already expired, you cannot work under this contract. Uh, second, the content of the document. Mm, here I put the articles of the labor code that speak uh, specifically about the contents of this document. I will elaborate on them a little bit further. Uh, just note that all uh, employment agreements have to include certain information that is listed in Article 19 Labor Code and contracts in addition to that information also have to include certain provisions which are listed in Article uh, 2612 of the Labor Code and you will see this, um, this type of information further in the presentation. And lastly, um, the termination of the contract or of the indefinite term agreement. There are um, common grounds of termination of employment in the labor legislation. And I will speak about them a little bit later briefly, but uh, the most important thing that you should understand is that indefinite term agreement can be terminated by an employee with a prior one month written notice. What does it mean? It means that um, at any time an employee is entitled to 
go to the director of the company or just go to the employer and say, I want to be dismissed in one month. And um, this is an absolute right of the employee. There, is, there are no exceptions. So this is one of the peculiarities of the indefinite term agreement. The employee can end it at any time with a one month prior notice and the employer cannot do anything about it. And uh, on the other hand, the contract has an end date. It is a fixed term contract. And it means that when this contract uh, expires, when it comes to an end, uh, the parties may just terminate the relationship and that's it. Um, they will have no obligations toward each other. Um, but also the, the other side of the medal is that in practice, it is very difficult to, to terminate contract if either of the parties refuses to. Um, so this is another side of concluding a contract. But um, as I mentioned previously, contracts are the most common, the most popular type of employment agreement. So um, if you start a company, you will most likely conclude contracts with your employees. And now, um, this is what I call the contact, the content of uh, an agreement. Here I put just the, um, the extracts from the labor code for you to, to just have a general understanding what kind of information has to be there in an employment agreement. Uh, and Article 19 Labor Code is the article that says about compulsory provisions that have to be included into any agreement. That is such information as um, the, the parties of the contract, obviously the place of work, the labor function or the position, the job title, if you wish, main rights and obligations of the parties, work rest regime, such as working hours, periods for lunch and rest, and remuneration for work, well, the, the amount of salary to get paid. But also, um, if we speak about contracts, there are also special provisions that have to be included in any contract and you can see them on the screen um, well this is very very legal language uh, but it's just something that you also need to to always keep in mind if you conclude a contract with an employee there are certain provisions that have to be there no matter what such as days and frequency of the salary payment um, obligation to notify each other about your wish to continue or to terminate the employment and other provisions which you may see on the screen and due to the lack of time I will not be further elaborating about them but uh, it has to be taken into account but also what is important here is that an employment contract uh, indefinite term um, agreement or a contract it has to also contain certain key provisions which we as a law firm working with labor issues all, always recommend to include those are of course confidentiality provisions if you're not signing a separate non-disclosure agreement with, uh, with your employee, you have to include confidentiality provisions in the employment contract in order to ensure some kind of confidentiality of your commercial secret, of your confidential information. Also, there are intellectual property clauses. Uh, this is applicable to your company in cases specifically if you are dealing with software development or development of other intellectual property objects um, in order to avoid further disputes um, connected with intellectual property we recommend including uh, certain ip um, rights provisions into the um, into the labor employment agreements also we recommend to include consent for personal data collection um, now we don't have the uh, sp uh, the special regulation, special law on personal data adopted yet, but I think it will it will be adopted soon. But nevertheless, um, we already recommend our clients to include a certain provision that states in the contract that the employee gives their consent to collect and to process and to store to keep personal data by the employer. So this will also help to avoid potential conflict, potential violations of um, personal data regulations in future. 
And um, there are also different provisions that you can include into the contract. If they do not contradict the law, then you can inc include whatever you wish, depending on the type of your business. So now um, I suggest to talk a little bit about the employees remuneration, which is salary for the work. Um, here I listed certain important provisions that need to be taken into account. First of all, the amount of minimum basic salary that is established by law. And that is currently um, 400 Belarusian rubles. So this is the, the minimum salary that any employer, notwithstanding uh, what kind of company it is, whether it is state owned or privately owned, any employer is obliged to pay at least 400 Belarusian rubles for a full-time work of an employee. But there is no upper limit for the salary amount so um, the question of how much you should pay to your employees remains up to you. It remains open always because it's it always up to the company to decide how much money it is ready to pay uh, for, for the work of the employees. Um, what is also important to understand is that the employer serves as a tax agent uh, for the employees. So the employer as the company is obliged to deduct and to pay the income tax on behalf of the employees, which is now 13%. Um, and the same goes to the contributions to the social security fund, which we know in Russian as FSZN. Um, so the employer is also obliged to deduct and pay 1% of the salary of the income of the employee to the social security fund. Um, and one more important aspect of the salary is that um, decrease of salary is considered as the change of essential working conditions. And under the labor code, change of essential working conditions is subject to special regulation. So you cannot just say to your employee that starting from tomorrow, your salary will be, um, will be lower. Uh, in this case, you will violate the law and the employee will have all the rights to, to sue you in court. Uh, what you need to do is to give the employee, if you want to decrease the salary for some reason, um, you need to give your employee um, a one month prior notice, written notice, which is important, um, to notify uh, your employee that uh, his or her salary will be decreased in one month. And... Um, in case the employee refuses to work under this changed essential working condition, then you as the employer will have the right to dismiss this employee. You will have the right to fire this employee um, based on such ground as refusal to work under this changed essential working conditions. Um, well, about the salary, I think this is all that I had to say. And now we are coming to the last part. Um, which is office work versus remote work. It is now very popular to, uh, well, let's say popular, <laughs> to transfer employees to remote work, which means that they work not from the office, but from, from home or from any preferred place. Uh, we all know the reason for this. This is the pandemic and the need to adjust to current conditions where um, the employees sometimes get sick, uh, the employees have to stay isolated. In some countries it is even um, compulsory um, and it is regulated by the law. In Belarus it is less strict, but we still have some regulations and we have some recommendations from the authorities that sick people are not allowed to enter the office, they're not allowed to contact with anyone. So in this case we also had recent introductions into the labor code uh, that became effective in January last year. Um, this is the introduction of so-called remote work. So what, what does it mean? It means that now it is legally permissible for um, the employee to perform the work remotely um, and not from the employer's office, which is usually the case. Um, so the main differences between work uh, from office and remote work is that um, in the office, the work is carried out in ordinary manner 
usually at the employ employer's premises. And um, when we are talking about remote work, then the work itself and the communication with the employer is carried out remotely by the means of information technologies, such as the internet, of course, uh, email, telephone, messengers, different websites, platforms, anything that can be handy for, for the parties to communicate and to exchange information between them. Second important distinction is that um, during the remote work, the employee does not have a workplace. The employee is free to decide where to work, from which place to work. Uh, so um, the employee is not obliged to come to the office every day. The employee is not obliged to come to the office at all in this case. And um, lastly, the communication with the employer when we're dealing with the remote work is done in a certain manner um, via internet, as I already mentioned, via email or by exchange of paper documents by post. It is also one of the, um, one of the ways to communicate with each other. But what has to be underlined here? Um, one of the very useful aspects of remote work is that you can exchange documents, tasks, um, and basically any information remotely. But when it comes to actually signing the contract for remote work, this has to be done in the employee's presence. So if you decide to transfer your employee to, uh, to remote work, you shall first uh, sign the contract physically being present at, in the same room, let's say. And after that, you, uh, as an employee, you are free to, to perform your work anywhere. Um, also, the employer may provide the employee with the equipment and the software needed to perform the work. Um, and uh, on the other hand, the employee may perform work using their own equipment, their own computers, laptops, whatever. Um, it, everything is decided between the parties. So here the parties have um, actually a very broad range of, uh, of ways and rights how to, how to organize this work, uh, if it does not contradict the law, of course, and if it does not violate the employee's interests. Um, so I think my time has run up now and maybe I have some minutes for questions. Um, I hope this information was useful for you and I'm ready to answer any, any questions or any comments. Yes, thank you so much for this amazing speech, Anna. And there are some questions. Um, the first one is in Russian. Нужно ли уплачивать налоги государству, работая во фрилансе на самого себя? Я могу ответить по-русски, если вопрос тоже на русском. Смотрите, работая на самого себя, это... Да, это, это работа, получается, человек работает как, ну, либо просто как физическое лицо, либо как индивидуальный предприниматель, и, конечно же, в этом случае тоже нужно уплачивать налог, это будет подоходный налог 100% с физического лица, потому что все физлицы уплачивают подоходный налог 13%, просто единственное тут различие в том, что если вы работаете по трудовому договору, то этот налог за вас уплачивает наниматель, но он все равно уплачивается с ваших же денег, то есть с вашей зарплаты. Если вы работаете сам на себя, как фрилансер, то есть у вас нет никакого трудового договора, вы напрямую там получаете деньги от заказчиков, например, да, то тогда вы этот налог обязаны уплачивать сами. Вы сами заполня... заполняете декларацию, подаете в налоговые органы, и тот же самый взнос в СЗН 1% тоже вы уплачиваете, и подоходный налог, конечно, тоже. Поэтому, да, мой ответ – нужно уплачивать. С любых доходов нужно уплачивать налог. Хорошо, спасибо. Thank you for your answer. Um, the next question. Can contract be terminated during the probation period, if there is any? Uh, yes. Um, there is such ground of termination of the contract as uh, termination due to failure to go through the probation period. And under the law, um, under the labor code, the maximum term of probation period is three months. So um, 
if the, your employee is under probation period, then you as the employer may terminate the contract at any day with a prior, if I'm not mistaken, three days notice. Uh, well, I, I may be wrong here, but there should be some notice. Um, or you can terminate the contract at the end of the probation period. So there are two, um, two, two uh, grounds for termination in this case. But yes, it can be terminated during the probation period. This is what the probation period is actually used for, <laughs> to, to see if you, um, if you can do the job. Okay, thank you so much. And the last but not least question for today, can you tell more about the company you work at as BH Law Offices? Uh, of course, I will gladly do so. <laughs> um, well, my company as BH Law Offices is um, a company that deals mostly with commercial matters. We, uh, our clients are mostly businesses. We have offices in Minsk and in Kyiv in Ukraine. So we uh, deal with court disputes and with various commercial matters such as corporate matters, labor matters, uh, M&D transactions, investments, taxes, um, anything that can be potentially useful for businesses. Um, I personally deal with labor issues and with general contract law, with foreign investments, sometimes with taxes. Um, and my colleague Ekaterina Lagvinovich, who also presented here before me, she deals with investments, with IT law, which is also um, a, a branch which we work on, um, and with corporate matters. So basically, anything that may be um, that may be needed for a business, we can cover it. <laughs>